name is David Russell. I'm the Director of Predict Analytics at LPA Software Solutions. Today we're going to talk about IBM Data Science Experience, also known as DSX, which is part of the IBM Watson Data Platform. So to start the conversation, we'll give you an introduction to Watson Data Platform, what it is, and some of the components that are part of it, including DSX. So Watson Data Platform is all about connecting users to data and analytics. It's based on the Spark Analytics Operating System, which is really a, a new tool that's been developed over the past several years, part of the Apache project. IBM supports this open source product that provides a massively parallel processing capability for performing analytics of many different varieties. That backbone provides a cloud native application or set of applications that work to meet the needs of several different personas who are involved in processing and analyzing data today. You know, because analyzing data is a team sport. There are people that have to work to keep the data organized and make sure the data is where it belongs and is stored in a fashion that can be used for other purposes. And those data engineers work with different tools uh, to help govern the data and make sure the right data is in the right place at the right time. You have your business analysts who are looking at the data and asking questions from the business perspective. You know, how can we do our business better? How can we be more efficient? How can we make new products that our customers will love? Uh, and those types of questions, you know, your data can provide some great insights there. And so they're going to be asking questions of the data, trying to understand what they can there. Application developers are developing those new products or even internal applications that are needed to run the business more efficiently. And they need access to data and analytics in order to enhance those applications, whether that be embedding reports and charts and graphs in an application or whether that's using a model that's been developed and deployed uh, and accessing that model through an API to allow them to make use of data and insights that have been identified. The persona we're going to be talking about the most today are the data scientists. When they're doing data science, they need access to all of the data that they can get their hands on. They need to be able to operate on it efficiently, and they need processing horsepower to be able to manage the large data sets. You know, we've been talking about big data for a number of years now, and, you know, big data has a different definition for everyone, but certainly we are getting to the point where data sets that we're working with grow very quickly in certain applications, and the ability to work with you know, larger platforms and, you know, hosted or cloud platforms can provide the scalability necessary to allow you to make those analyses more efficient and more effective. You know, the process of analyzing data internally, you know, really involves that governance of the entire process to make sure that you understand what your data looks like and the metadata describing that data and setting up policies for what data should be used in what situation. But then you have an iterative process of ingesting new data from any of a number of sources that might be on-premise or in the cloud or might be structured or unstructured data. But once you've ingested that data, you've got different things you can do with it. You can deploy that data directly into reports. You might persist that data into some storage mechanism uh, for long-term storage or for analysis. You're going to analyze that data, build those predictive models using machine learning techniques, or just do some discovery and exploration, you know, maybe not standard reports, but looking at visualizations to try to understand what data you have and what the implications of that data are on your business. But you want to be working with, you know, common data across all of those areas and across all of those personas, and you want to be looking at you know, the same pipelines and projects for moving that data throughout the organization. So if we look a little bit closer at each of these different steps and each of these different personas, there are different products that IBM has that make up this Watson data platform that are used at the different 
points in the process and are used by different personas. So today we're going to be focusing on the data science experience that's built for the data scientists, but you also have Bluemix Data Connect that focuses on the data engineer and their needs. We have the business analyst that can use Watson Analytics, which is a cloud-based tool for doing smart data discovery and finding insights by asking questions instead of having to come to your data with a preconceived notion necessarily of what you're looking for. And you have our application developers who have the Bluemix platform in general, and that provides them you know, DevOps systems and platforms, whether those platforms be virtual machines that they can create in the cloud through Bluemix, or whether that be shared application server capabilities or object storage or databases. All of those services are available through Bluemix platform and integrate effectively with Data Connect, Data Science Experience, and Watson Analytics. You'll also see that each of the steps, ingest, analyze, persist, deploy, and govern, that there are different tools that IBM provides or is going to be providing that provide that can be used at each of these points, whether those be a Spark service that's available to you in the cloud for doing analysis or data science experience itself that uses a Spark service in the cloud, or whether you're doing deployment and you're building Watson machine learning, you're using that tool to deploy a predictive model that you've previously built. Each of these steps are supported in some way by the Watson Data Platform and continues to grow and expand uh, as IBM improves the capabilities in the cloud and makes enhancements to the existing tools as well. So as the open source ecosystem develops, you know, Watson Data Platform really is intended to be a backbone of services and capabilities that can be built upon through tools that people are already using uh, whether those be simply open standards that can be used and access data with, you know, or used within Watson Data Platform or access data within Watson Platform, to accepted tools that are available, whether that be, you know, Python, which is a primary programming language so supported by DSX, or whether that be Anaconda or other tools that you have deployed, and you can also build upon that with even further broader areas of trusted partners who are developing applications taking advantage of all of these things. And really, you know, when we talk about these different tools, whether it be Bluemix or Watson Analytics or Data Science Experience, these are tailored experiences for users to be able to collaborate together in this job of analyzing data. And the wheel sort of shows that, you, you know, you have different types of input and output and analyses that need to be performed and different people work on different areas here. So the colors sort of represent the different personas and you can see, you know, data engineers, they're mostly interested in this ingesting the data, transforming the data in some fashion with the input and analysis step. You know, they're less interested in exploring and understanding the data, but that's still part of what they have to do because they have to understand what they need to do to transform and clean the data. You know, similarly, the data, data scientists, you know, they're going to be, you know, pulling data in, ingesting data, transforming it all the time. You know, that's part of what they do. They're going to spend a lot more time exploring the data to understand what it is, what it looks like, and what form it takes. And then they're going to be spending most of their time on the analysis of the data and trying to understand, you know, what they can there. The business analyst is going to be focused here on this analysis and output. They're going to want to be able to communicate the results, you know, just like the data scientist needs to be able to communicate results to a lesser degree. But the business analyst is really going to be driving home how that analysis impacts the business and needs to be able to express that to the larger uh, business community. And your application developers, well, they're mostly interested in pulling data in, evaluating that data, and delivering and deploying models from that data. But So each of these people has very specific things that they need to be doing, but they're all going to be working together to get the most out of the data that you have. And they need to be able to share information and share the processes that they're working on so that they can more efficiently uh, interact and you know, gain those insights that the data can provide. So. We've said we're going to focus on data science experience, so let's really talk about data science experience and what it is. So data science experience is really a cloud-based tool, primarily cloud-based tool, as you'll see. We'll talk about you know, deployment options a little later um, for 
the data scientist to learn, create, and collaborate. Uh, there are tools or capabilities within data science experience that allow the data science scientists to not only learn about their data, but learn about new techniques and new capabilities that are out there in the community. Uh, and you know whether that be through tutorials or through shared notebooks or shared information on the web, you know that's part of part and parcel built into data science experience. So you're not having to go elsewhere necessarily and move all around in order to be able to learn more. You know, the creation is really at the core of it. You know, we want to be able to create new predictive models. We want to be able to create new capabilities within our analysis of our data and create uh, whether I'm creating new data or just creating new insights and gaining new insights. You know, that's really that the focus there. Uh, you know, Data science experience is ba ba based on the best of the open source community and then has value added products from IBM as well. And then the other piece of data science is this collaboration. You know, one person looking at a data set is going to gain some insight and they're going to be able to provide some information about what's going on there. But collaboration is key. Bringing different viewpoints, bringing different opinions, bring different ideas about how to look at the data, how to organize the data, how to prepare the data for modeling it can be invaluable in this space. And so the social features of DSX and the ability to share the notebooks and the information you're working on with other people can be incredibly valuable as you're performing different analyses and as you're working through you know, your data science experience. So what are the things that the data scientist is challenged with and pain points they see? You know, uh, one of them is this rigid tool set. Um, you know, uh, the, the idea of choosing one and only one approach can be limiting for a data scientist. You, you can't really connect everything that you need and, and navigating between the different tools can be a problem. You know, uh, there's some reality there. You know, what we're finding in the world is that you know the necessary flexibility or the need for flexibility when you're doing data science has required that data science groups uh, sort of open things up and just let people use whatever tool that they want and frequently this ends up with different data scientists having different platforms installed on different machines and being able to collaborate and work together and share that you know can be a problem you know if I don't have my environment set up for the right version of Python that my um, collaborator is working on, maybe I can't work with the script that they have. And a lot of those um, you know, aren't necessarily rigid tool sets. We've opened it up and allowed them to use lots of different ones, but they can create issues, you know, and that really gets to this fragmented and time consuming, you know, we, where we've got lots of different environments that don't work together. You know, sharing with people can be a problem. You know, each tool and environment and each, you know, whether you're working with Python or Scala or R, you have different groups of people working on them and they're sort of separate and you have to go and you find yourself frequently feeling like you need to focus on one uh, because you don't have time or ability uh, to go and find all of the different p players on the web that are talking about the different environments. Um, and then the last is this analytic silo concept, the idea that, you know, Maintaining versions can be difficult, you know, if I've got Python over here and R over here and I'm writing these codes and putting them in files and, and doing my coding and doing my maintenance, you know, you need to come up with some mechanism for storing versions and making sure that you keep track of whether it's versions of the data files or versions of the code that I'm using to analyze the data files, you know, that can become a headache. Uh, and, you know, it can be difficult to share the data uh, that you're working on and, and collaborating with people. And so that, you know, sort of highlights all in all of these things the different ways that you become sort of isolated in what you're doing and it can create silos that you've been trying to avoid uh, through all the analysis that you're doing. So data science experience is intended to overcome many of those limitations and you know it tries to overcome those through three tiers or three different capabilities or you know 
tools that are applied to it. You know, the first is community. Data science experience is, is built on the idea of a community, whether that community be uh, through sharing of data sets or tutorials on how to do certain things uh, and connecting data scientists through those techniques. Uh, but it also comes to asking questions. When you're in DSX, there's a chat box and you can uh, go into that chat box and ask questions and those questions go directly back to some of the developers that are working on building and improving DSX. Um, you know the ability to work in that community and, and even collaborate within that community. You know anytime you're working on a project within DSX you have the ability to add any one who has an ID and has a has a uh, has a DSX license, you can add them as a collaborator, and they can see the data that you're working on, and they can see the projects, the co the totality of the project that you're working on, to help them understand the data that you're pulling in and the analyses that you're doing, uh, and allow them to share in that. We build that community in DSX through use of open source tools that are already being used out there all over uh, for doing data science. Whether that's, you know, whether you want to code in Scala or Python or R or even if you want to write SQL, uh, there's some way for you to do something in DSX with any of those. Using Jupyter Notebooks, that's an excellent way to document and share your code and provide uh, a, a tool to express what did you intend when you were doing a particular step in your scripting uh, and keep all of that information in one place. Uh, the R Studio, uh, there's a you know collaboration with R Studio to actually embed R Studio in the cloud environment of DSX and that can be very valuable in that it gets you up and running with RStudio with no installation, no configuration. Not that RStudio is all that difficult to set up on your desktop, but it's awfully nice to sign onto the web and just have it available in your browser. Um, and there are other capabilities with open source. You can even bring in your own favorite libraries and deploy them into your data science experience environment. On top of that, we have capabilities that are being added every day. Uh, that are IBM added value. Things from Watson Machine Learning, which is a capability to take a model that you've deployed with, you know, XGBoost or Scikit-Learn in uh, your notebooks, and you can deploy those models as web services through an API from your notebook uh, through Watson Machine Learning. Or you can use Watson Machine Learning feed it a data set and have it train a model based on what you want to predict without any input from you and it's a fully automated system and then you can take the results of that model and deploy that uh, as well. Or another IBM value added piece, SPSS Modeler Canvas. DSX has a Canvas capability in the cloud that in your browser you can create streams just like you would an IBM SPSS modeler. Now, it's a little limited today. It doesn't have all of the nodes and all of the features that IBM SPSS modeler does, but you can take a, a stream that you've developed an IBM SPSS modeler for you modeler users. You can upload it to the cloud and you can execute it in the cloud and for nodes that are supported in the cloud, you can edit those nodes and change your stream through a completely web-based interface. You know, that's a way that you can start to collaborate between some of your data scientists that like to use R and Scala and Python and your data scientists that like to use a graphical tool to build up your stream of processing. And you can both be operating in the same environment in DSX. And this gives you an excellent bridge to that cloud uh, concept. If your you know, IT environment is moving to the cloud, and you've been trying to do SPSS Modeler and not sure how to do that, this might be a place that you could explore to move to the cloud through SPSS Modeler and DSX. Uh, you can do visualizations and you can do version control. Uh, you can take your projects that you're working on and you can save them as a particular version and they'll get marked and saved in that way. And then you can always go back to an old version and that works across that. You can also take individual notebooks or individual components and you can use GitHub if you like to use GitHub for storing your data and version control. You can do that as well. 
Uh, and the last piece that IBM adds value is this managed Spark service, this idea that I don't have to install a Spark service and build a Spark cluster uh, locally in order to process large sets of data and get the benefits and the power of Spark. I can simply take advantage of the Spark service that's part of DSX and that's provided through IBM Bluemix. So we've touched on a lot of these components of DSX, but just to give you an idea of those major components, you know, the, on the left side we have sort of the existing data sources that aren't really part of DSX, but they're accessible to it. Whether that's a Hadoop file system that you have or a database, you can pull data from those into DSX through connections, or you can take files that you have and load them directly into DSX. Most frequently you use uh, the IBM Bluemix object store. Uh, to store your data assets uh, that you're going to make part of your projects. Um, but those data assets, along with the list of collaborators that you're working with, and your notebooks, which are analytic assets, uh, and there are other analytic assets now beyond notebooks, including uh, your predictive models from Watson uh, Machine Learning. Uh, but all of those are incorporated into a project and stored together uh, in a way that you can, uh, you know, through that list of collaborators, share your data assets and your notebooks with other users uh, in the web. They can come in, they can, and depending on what access you give them, they may be able to simply view the results or they may be able to edit your notebook and actually get in there and help to work. Your runtime environment is based on Spark, uh, but you can also access other web services and other capabilities in that runtime environment, including decision optimization. So if you're familiar with CPLEX or linear solvers, uh, decision optimization is a cloud-based, has a cloud-based component that can be accessed through DSX and becomes part of that runtime environment. And then your tools and visualizations. You have Jupyter, which are your notebooks, and RStudio gives you additional tools that you can work with. All of these things come together to make up the entire DSX platform. When you're working with a Spark service, one of the things that comes up is that people talk about the fact that, you know, we've been moving to Hadoop in a lot of cases for analyzing big data and the idea of, you know, Hadoop allows you to store your data in a um, multi-node system and take the analysis to the data by doing the analysis on those same nodes. And one of the things that people talk about with Spark is Spark is providing you a cluster of analysis capabilities, but it doesn't have built into it storage capabilities. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that Hadoop is while it's a great place to store data and analyze it, it isn't necessarily the best for long-term storage, doesn't have a lot of the protections for long-term storage. So one of the things that Bluemix provides that works very well with Spark service is this object storage component, which is a you know inexpensive and scalable uh, storage location that's intended for retention, long-term retention of massive amounts of unstructured data. It's intended to be resilient and self-healing so that you don't lose data over time and you don't have uh, some of the problems that have occurred with larger Hadoop installations. But it works closely with Spark and allows for a Spark API to access that object storage directly to quickly load data out of that object storage into your multi-node uh, environment uh, for processing with Spark. And so object storage is a, is a key component within the capabilities for using uh, DSX. This is just to give you an idea of all of the different uh, potential sources that you can access through DSX, uh, whether they be on-premise in your location or whether they be um, cloud connections. So, you know, on the source side, we can pull from many, many different uh, places, whether that be within the IBM cloud when you're talking about DashDB, which is now called uh, DB2 Warehouse on Cloud, or whether you're talking about IBM's Cloudant or Big Insights. But with IBM's focus on hybrid cloud, and when they talk about hybrid cloud, they mean hybrid cloud being your 
on-premise versus public cloud or a private cloud or even another cloud. So whether that be sources on Microsoft Azure or Amazon Redshift or S3, uh, there are capabilities to load that data into DSX directly uh, from wherever that source may be. And then slightly fewer places that you can write data to, um, but it certainly approaches the list of sources that you can load data for analysis. I mentioned SPSS and the idea of these flows within DSX. Um, they are compatible with SPSS modeler streams uh, and you can do different runtime environments uh, within the DSX flows. But you can see, you know, there's similarity here uh, between the SPSS modeler version of this stream and then once it's loaded into DSX you can see the flow presents a slightly different view. It's a little bit different um, skin, <laughs> if you will, uh, and look to the stream, but it has a lot of the same nodes and things that you would see uh, and it looks nearly in many ways very similar uh, to what you have in your SPSS modeler. And so it's a relatively familiar environment. There's certainly different keystrokes and things involved with a web-based interface um, as opposed to the uh, traditional FAT client in SPSS modeler. Uh, but it gives you an excellent way to move to the cloud and also move to a more integrated environment that allows you to work with other uh, individuals and uh, that may have other capabilities or other uh, tools that they prefer, whether that be R, Python, or Scala, uh, and be able to combine some of that into DSX in this shared cloud environment. So we're in the, to the point in this procedure where we'll actually look at uh, what DSX looks like. Uh, so let's bring up DSX and take a look together. Uh, but when you first log into DSX, uh, you're introduced to the community. And in this community area, you have articles, data sets, notebooks, and tutorials that are have been shared into the community by different users in, from different locations and different uh, people in this public environment. Um, you can search for these. So in my case, I searched CSV object storage because I was looking for some help and guidance on that, and it provides me a subset of the overall list. Uh, if I remove that, it provides me all of the latest uh, results. I can filter down to articles or data sets or notebooks or even tutorials. If I look at a notebook, uh, I can open that notebook and I can copy it directly into my instance of DSX and start working on it right away. Um, within DSX, I can create projects. Uh, so if I view all of my projects in DSX, uh, you'll see that I can organize my analyses into different uh, projects based on what I'm working on today. And then I can open up the project and I can see, so I have multiple notebooks that I have listed. I have models. Uh, these are predictive models that have been trained and potentially deployed. Um, and I also have flows where these are essentially flows uh, that are the SPSS-like uh, graphical streams. I can get an overview of the overall um, data sets, data assets and notebooks that are supported, or I can go look at very specific things. If I look at deployments, um, I'll see where these models have been deployed, what versions and, and how they've been deployed. I can also go and I can configure collaborators. In this case, I don't have any collaborators on this notebook or on this project, but I can add collaborators here and I can set what permissions they have to be either an administrator where they can do anything or a viewer or an editor. Uh, and you know, viewers obviously can only see things uh, that are here. Editors uh, can edit and then admins can add new collaborators and things like that as well. So if we look at one of these notebooks, so 
I have this, this is a notebook that is one of the, the tutorial notebooks that are available through the community. Uh, and I pulled this in to work with it and to uh, look specifically at how we would interact with the IBM Watson machine learning APIs. Uh, this notebook is a great starting point. Uh, it shows taking a, a data set that's publicly available uh, about uh, heart disease and building a model to try to predict the diagnosis of heart disease based on uh, other inputs about a particular patient. Uh, in this case, it's completely anonymous. We just have ages and some of their lab results. Um, and But based on those, we're able to build a model. So as you see, we have this interspersed, you know, in the notebook, we have the interspersed comments and information along with these code blocks. And each of these code blocks can be executed individually. And once you've executed one of those code blocks, it stores the results in the uh, processing engine. And then you can run any of the other code blocks expecting that data to already be there. You can get, you know, relatively pretty output, you know, of what the data set looks like. So this is a fairly, you know, narrow data set uh, here with, you know, it's probably 315 rows or so in the data set. And in this it goes through and it allows you through a code, uh, through coding uh, in Python in this case, uh, we're using the XGBoost library, if you're familiar with it, to uh, build up a model, save that model, and then uh, at the end we're deploying that model into Watson Machine Learning. And when we deploy that model into Watson Machine Learning, uh, it becomes available for us to score as a web service. So what that means is uh, I have a web service that I can call this request.post. Uh, I can, when I execute this particular um, block of code, it's going to take that set of input values that are entered and push those out through the web service API. Let me get back to the point I had to get us into edit mode for the notebook. But it's going to pass these values as inputs to a web service. I'm going to call that web service to score with that payload. And when I run that, basically it returns back with the predicted value here of 1. Uh, so that means that based on these inputs, it's predicting that this person would be diagnosed with heart disease. And it gives us some idea of the probability uh, based on that model. And that was all built with the model itself was trained and created and then deployed uh, through the rest of this notebook. And for those of you that uh, are familiar with using XGBoost and Python, you know that capability of deploying to machine learning can be pretty valuable to make that available to your application developers who may want to take advantage of that model. So, you know, when we get those models deployed, you know, I mentioned you also have the option of just training your own model. So I can click on new model. And in this case, I'm going to call this a heart disease quick model. And I just have to connect it to a couple of services. You know, by default, it uses the services associated with the project that I previously set up. Um, and I'm just going to tell it I want to create an automatic model. So it's going to give me a list of all of the CSV data sources that are currently in my project. So I'm going to use this Cleveland data, which is, you know, the Cleveland Clinic uh, heart disease data. And I'm going to hit next. And it's going to ask me one more question about what kind of prediction I want to do. In this case, I have a single value that's either a 1 or a 0 based on what, whether someone is predicted uh, to have heart disease or not. Or no, actually, it's one or zero based on whether they have been diagnosed with heart disease in the past. So I'm going to tell them, okay, I want to predict whether they've been diagnosed or not. And I want to predict that based on all of these columns. And the reason I'm actually picking them instead of just saying all is there is a column called num here at the end that's part of my CSV that's just a record identifier and I don't want to use that record identifier in the model. It's a binary classification because we're just trying to choose between one or zero and I hit next and at this point 
DSX has sent that uh, CSV file through an automated modeling tool. It's going through and it has split the data up the way I've talked, the, the way I told it to percentage wise, um, where it's taking about 60% of the data to train the model with, it's taking about 30% of that data to test with, and then it's evaluating finally uh, with a smaller uh, set uh, that last 10% of the data or so. And so in this case, you know, this data set, we know that we've got a decent predictive model that will come out of it. So basically it tells us that it's trained and evaluated the model, that it has good performance. It gives us an idea of the area under our rock curve. And um, we can look at that and we can say, well, that's, you know, pretty good. We've got sort of 88% covered by this model. So now I have options on what I want to do. Do I want to save this model? Do I want to go back and, you know, pick a different training set, may, or not a different training set, but maybe I want to go back and pick a different technique. Uh, instead of, in this case, I just left it with logistic regression. Uh, maybe I want to go back and ch change the options if it didn't evaluate very well. But in this case, I'm just going to save the model. And once it, the model has been saved, I have the option of deploying it um, very much like uh, when I when I, if you're working with this uh, through the APIs, you create the model and you save it, and then you have the option of deploying it. And when you deploy it, you're creating this web service interface to it uh, that can be called remotely. Um, you know, again, we can look and evaluate. This is the details of the model. And here, to create a deployment, I just click Add a Deployment. I'll name it, and it will create that uh, web service for me. Um, few other things, you know, creating notebooks is pretty simple, you know, create a new notebook. Uh, when you create the new notebook, you can either create a blank notebook or if you have a, you can save any notebook out of um, the Jupyter Notebooks and save that to a file. Um, you can upload that file and it'll, that's one way to share notebooks not using the community area. You can also have URLs. So if I store a notebook out in GitHub, I can provide a, note, uh, a uh, URL to go access that and it will pull it into my version of DSX. When I create the notebook, I choose a language. Each notebook has a single language embedded in it. Um, but I can choose which language I'm going to use to program in, in that notebook. And I can choose which Spark version I'm going to execute. Uh, within. I associate a particular Spark service to execute the notebook and then when I hit create I've got a new notebook that I can start editing and start doing my development uh, with uh, DSX. The variety of other tools, the last one I'll do is I'll pull up a flow just to give you a feel uh, for what this what a flow looks like in DSX. Uh, as you saw from the picture, it looks very similar to an SPSS uh, stream that you might have. Uh, but as mentioned, you know, the flow can actually be an SPSS flow, or it could be uh, a flow that creates Spark uh, capable code underneath or a pipeline. So here, you know, you have similar to uh, SPSS, we have our connected nodes. Uh, we can click on a node, uh, or in this case, I can, let's see, I'll double click on this node, and it allows me to set my options for that node, similar to what I would do in SPSS Modeler. Um, and then once I've set those, I can hit OK or Cancel, uh, and that allows me to execute and run to build the model. So just like in SPSS, this node, this particular node, is a categorization model and when you run that it will generate the gold nugget which is the trained model. Um, you can then run an analysis and so I can come in here run my analysis node and when I run my analysis node it will process the data file. In this case the data file is being loaded from dash db and being fed through this stream and then I can open up and I can view what did my uh, model look like? So, you know, as you see, this is not a very good model from the analysis. We have, you know, it's really only correct 44% of the time. Uh, well, although 
we have to look at our coincidence matrices to really understand what's going on because we are trying to do a multi-valued uh, categorization so that 44% might not be as bad as I make it out to be initially. Um, but you can evaluate the coincidence matrix and it's very similar, you know, same sorts of uh, information and capabilities, uh, slightly different output uh, than what you would get uh, in Modeler. And you can zoom in and out sort of like in Modeler uh, as well. So that concludes the demonstration portion. Obviously, that's a very quick tour uh, of DSX and the capabilities, uh, but hopefully that gave you a flavor for what you can expect from that. So I mentioned needing to talk about the uh, deployment. So we were just working with the cloud instance, and that you can go, and using the URL earlier in the presentation, you can go directly out to Data Science Experience and use that in the cloud. Uh, LPA can certainly help you get set up and started uh, with a subscription to DSX in the cloud. Um, you can also uh, get DSX for your desktop. That's a um, single instance, single node uh, component. It gives you a smaller environment, but gives you everything already pre-installed and pre-configured with the Jupyter Notebooks and capabilities. You don't have some of the access directly to uh, Watson Machine Learning and everything the same way that you do in the cloud, but it gives you a lot of the same tools uh, without necessarily having to configure your environment, and it gives you a great place to start as an individual on your desktop. You also have DSX Local is an option. Uh, again, there are some services that aren't available in the local deployment, but for the most part, you get DSX Local allows you to build out your own cloud, a local cloud or a private cloud, and deploy the different workloads for supporting DSX across that local cloud. Um, and that gives you an environment that you completely control, that is not outside your firewall, uh, but it's another option for deployment. And just recently announced is the IBM Integrated Analytics System. Uh, this is, uh, if you are familiar with um, the uh, Natiza platform is the oldest name of it, but it's a dedicated data warehouse appliance uh, or data storage appliance uh, that is a rack mounted system that IBM fully supports uh, that you can load massive volumes of data and have massive processing power uh, massive parallel processing power available to you to store, retrieve, and analyze your data. The latest version was just released in the last month, and the IBM Integrated Analytics System is included with that release. And this is your SQL-ready, massively parallel database with DSX embedded and installed on the platform. So that's built in, and so once you load your data into this environment, you have DSX to analyze your data and to be able to collaborate and share with others in your organization in a great on-premise system that is all pre-configured and ready to go uh, for doing your data science, and as the tagline says, doing your data science faster. So thank you for being with us, with us today. Last question for you would be, how can LPA help you? And, uh, you know, there are a number of different ways that we could help you today. Uh, the first, you know, if you're an SPSS modeler customer and you thought there was something interesting about that flow and people have been talking about they need to move your capabilities to the cloud, or if you've been looking to uh, integrate more closely with your colleagues that may be working in R or Scala, or if you're hiring new uh, data analysts out of college that are more familiar with R and using notebooks, uh, but you still want to have the capacity to work with modeler streams. You know, we can talk to you about bridge to cloud options where we can help to have, you know, some uplift over your current price for your renewal of SPSS, but we could work with you to include DSX as, an, uh, as another component of your renewal process. Um, 
we can help you get data started with DSX or even the whole Watson data platform if you have interest there, you know, with, whether it's Watson Analytics, Data Connect, DB2 Warehouse on Cloud uh, that used to be known as DashDB uh, or DSX itself. We can help you with training and enablement uh, or and even longer term sitting with your analysts and helping them as they begin their journey there and uh, start developing models and gaining insight uh, through analyzing your data. Or you can even ask us about our predictive analytics services. This is where LPA can help your organization develop predictive models to transform your business. And we may apply DSX and the Watson Data Platform and other tools to help you uh, as you're starting to gain uh, traction or capabilities around predictive analytics. You may not be, you may want to apply predictive analytics today and may not have the resources on staff. Uh, talk to us about uh, how we could help you there as well. So again, thank you for your time. Uh, hopefully you've learned something about DSX and the Watson Data Platform in general. Uh, certainly contact us if you have more questions or if there are things that we can help you with. And uh, we hope that you are able to journey to the cloud and journey through your data analysis uh, and that LPA can help you with that.